The Exorcist prequels. I'm doing this as one video because, frankly, neither of these movies is worth that much of my time. I'm not bothering with the trailer either, so we're just going to jump right the hell into the disaster that was these productions. <laughs> so what happened was, someone had the bright idea that they were going to do a prequel to The Exorcist telling the story of Father Marin, the Max von Sydow character from the first two films. Father Marin was the title character, technically, of both movies, even though he wasn't in them that much. So, they brought in Stellan Skarsgård, who was roughly the exact same age as Max von Sydow when he played the Exorcist in the original film, just he was in heavy old age makeup, so he looked much older. So they get Stellan Skarsgård, who is a noted character actor. He's not really a leading man. It's kind of surprising they went in that direction. But, um, I mean, he's been good in things. Uh, probably best known currently for the Thor movies. He's the kind of wacky scientist guy in those. I probably know him best as the villain in Ronin. I feel like he's a better villain than he is a good guy. But he's got a pretty long career and a fairly famous family. I mean, most of his kids have gone on to do something. I mean, one of them is uh, Pennywise in the It movies. One of them is Loki in the, uh, the Vikings TV show on the History Channel. I think he has a daughter somewhere in there. Uh, I see the name Skarsgård, although I don't know how common that is where he's from, so I don't know if those are possibly unrelated to him. But regardless, he was chosen to lead this thing, and originally it was supposed to be directed by John Frankenheimer. Now, the weird part about that is John Frankenheimer directed the sequel to The French Connection. The French Connection was the hit classic cop film directed by William Friedkin, who did the first Exorcist movie. So they brought in the guy who did the sequel to the original director's breakout film. It, it's a bit odd. But John Frankenheimer had a pretty long career. It was moderately respected. He had a couple of genuine classics in there. Uh, probably best known for The Manchurian Candidate, the original version from the 60s with uh, Frank Sinatra. Uh, but he, he had some other movies in there. Um, in the late 90s, his career had a bit of a comeback because of the movie Ronin, which was a uh, Robert De Niro spy film that is very good. Uh, it was written by David Mamet. But John Frankenheimer's health was failing, so it, more or less the last po possible moment he pulled out of this movie. And the job went to Paul Schrader. Now, Paul Schrader had had a couple of notable indie hits at this point with uh, Affliction, which is a fantastic uh, Oscar-winning uh, drama starring Nick Nolte and the late, great James Coburn and Sissy Spacek about alcoholism and domestic abuse. And he directed a movie called Autofocus about the life and death of a famous sitcom star from the 70s named Bob Crane, who was a notorious sex addict. Both those movies are phenomenal. Neither one of those is a horror movie. <laughs> Paul Schrader, in his entire career as a director or a screenwriter, he's actually a bit better known as a screenwriter than a director, really only had one horror film, and it was not a successful one. It was a remake of a classic movie called Cat People. His version starred uh, Malcolm McDowell and Natasha Kinski. It was released in the early 80s, and it's a weird enough movie that has a cult following, even though it's not very good. I've, I've watched it twice, and both times it was just a chore to sit through. I didn't care for that movie. It's very garish, very 80s, very hard to follow, honestly. Um, it's not a very good movie. Now, Paul Schrader, the screenwriter, I mean, he's worked with uh, Martin Scorsese four times. Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, Last Temptation of Christ, and Bringing Out the Dead. So he's a, he's a very accomplished screenwriter, but as a director, he's extremely hit or miss. He'll have a great movie like um, Blue Collar, which is a very, very good movie starring uh, Richard Pryor in a serious role at the 70s stand-up, and Harvey Keitel. Uh, he directed a movie called American Gigolo, which I've never seen, but it was credited as being the movie that made Richard Gere a star. Uh, then he had some misses. Uh, he directed a movie called Patty Hearst about the notorious hostage thing where the rich girl ended up um, aligning with her kidnappers to the point where she helped them rob a bank with the head being rames in it. It, was, it sucked. And he did some other crappy movies, and I think his most recent movie was that god-awful Lindsay Lohan movie, The Canyon. He's very hit or miss. And he was probably the wrong guy for this this movie. He flat out said, not unlike John Borman with The Exorcist 2, that he didn't want to do something like The Exorcist. He wanted to do a drama. And I like Paul Schrader, but he was the wrong man for this job. And essentially, he turned in a movie that was probably 80% done to the studio. And the studio hated it. And he essentially said, well, this is the movie I want to make. I'm not, I'm not interested in doing a ton of reshoots. And they fired his ass.
So, they had a movie that was almost completed, an origin story for Father Marin involving the discovery of a church beneath a church and uh, a demonically possessed, um, uh, disabled boy. And who uh, the disabled boy ends up becoming this kind of angelic creature because the, the possession actually fixes his body, leaving Marin with something of a crisis of conscience, whether or not he wants to expel this demon and doom this young man to a life of um, essentially um, infirmity, maybe would be the right word, disability. So they showed the movie print to Rennie Harlan. Now, Rennie Harlan's an action director. Rennie Harlan did Die Hard 2, um, Cliffhanger, the Stallone flick that they're apparently rebooting with an all-female cast, which is a bizarre idea, but fine, whatever. I don't care. I'm not going to see it. And the thing is, Rennie Harlan's not an especially good director. He understood uh, how to make movies that fit into that sort of late 80s, early 90s excess style, high action, vibe, but that was about it. He didn't really understand story structure or character development. And Rennie Harlan did have a horror pedigree. He actually broke through directing in Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, which I believe was the highest grossing of all the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. It's not the best of them by far. I would actually argue that of the Robert England Nightmare on Elm Street movies, it's the worst. But he... Um, he was riding on the goodwill built up by the first three movies, particularly one and three, which were very well received by audiences. So, and they showed him the movie, and he hated it. He showed, they showed him Paul Schrader's cut of the movie, and he hated it, and he said it was a total teardown, this is not salvageable, the movie needs to be shot again. And they said, you're our man, because they felt the exact same way. So they gave the job to Rennie Harlan, and they kept the same star and a couple of the supporting actors, but they completely rewrote the script. About the only real element kept from Paul Schrader's film is the the sequence that is sometimes jokingly called Marin's Choice, a reference to Sophie's Choice, the old movie where the woman had to decide which of her children to save. And uh, in this instance, Marin in Nazi-occupied Poland, I think, he's um, told that they're going to execute a certain number of people in the town, and as the, the town's priest, he's best um, situated to tell them who deserves to die. So he's essentially tasked with telling them who is the most expendable, who is the most sinful, who is the least deserving to live in this town. And obviously this experience breaks him, because they tell him that obviously they're, they're going to kill everybody unless he points out the certain people to kill. And he does it, and he becomes an alcoholic, and he has a crisis of faith. All of these movies seem to involve a priest with a crisis of faith. Whatever. <laughs> so that, that was really the only holdover from Paul Schrader's um, cut of the film. Aside from that, Rennie Harlan basically reshot the whole thing, recast many of the, the main characters, exchanged a sort of brooding, very slow drama for a sort of garish, silly horror film. And uh, keep in mind, this was the early 2000s. In the early 2000s, horror movies were, late 90s through to the early 2000s, horror movies were very, very specifically marketed to young people. They would usually have heavy metal uh, soundtracks. They would often have rappers or... TV stars in the main character, in the, the prime principal cast. Uh, PG-13 ratings were kind of being utilized a fair amount. It, it was kind of like right now. You know, right now we're kind of getting back to that, where we're seeing more PG-13 horror. We're seeing more um, attempts to bring in what you might call trendy cast members. Now, we had gotten away from that for a while with movies like Insidious or Sinister or The Conjuring. But the pendulum seems to be swinging back in that direction, where the, the emphasis is just, let's get this thing PG-13 and sell it to kids so we don't have to really try very hard. Now, at the very least, The Exorcist, the beginning, the movie that was theatrically released first, even though it was shot second, was an R rating. So, at the very least, they didn't fuck that up. But it's a terrible movie. And essentially, the movie was a moderate, you might say, theatrical success. It didn't do well exactly, but it did well enough. You know, it didn't, it was just another underperforming Exorcist follow up. I don't think it lost money, which I guess puts it head and shoulders above two and three, because I believe both of those lost a fortune. But it still wasn't a massive success, and there was a lot of interest in seeing Paul Schrader's cut. It was It's fairly unusual for a movie to be essentially finished and then shelved and reshot. Uh, the only other instance I can really think of that off the top of my head is the Wes Craven movie Cursed, which was actually reshot twice. That's That, was, that movie's production was a disaster. So this flick... 
people were really curious. They want to see the Paul Schrader cut, and because Paul Schrader had made a couple good movies recently, they assumed, well, it's got to be better than X was at the beginning, because that movie sucked. Honestly, Dominion, prequel to The Exorcist, which got a very limited theatrical release and then a, a, a home market release, isn't really all that much better than The Exorcist beginning. I mean, honest to God, all you're doing is you're deciding if you want to watch a really stupid movie or a really boring movie, which is why I couldn't bring myself to rewatch them to discuss them. I'm just, I'm basically just going off vague memories of the fact that I saw both movies when they first came out. Did a little bit of research. The, the story behind the movies is more interesting than the movies themselves. Both movies sucked. Dominion prequel The Exorcist isn't even really a complete film. Now, watching that movie, you have the impression that you're watching a word print. A very tight word print. I mean, they made an effort to make it look as good as they could without spending real money. That would be the polite way to say it, is that they didn't really, some of the effects are clearly unfinished. The movie doesn't seem to have been color corrected. A lot of it seems overlit or underlit. And the fact of the matter is, Paul Schrader is a talented, he, he knows how to make a movie, even if he makes a crappy movie like um, oh, The Canyons. Well, The Canyons actually was really badly made, but that was like a shoestring budget and had a lot of problems. Like The Walker, I believe that was that Woody Harrelson movie. Or um, Touch, the thing he did with Christopher Walken and Skeet Ulrich. Like these, these were bad movies, but at the very least they were well-made bad movies. Dominion prequel The Exorcist doesn't look finished. It looks like they got it about... Probably he, he handed them a movie that had no visual effects, you know, none of the, the digital effects finished. And then when there was an interest in watching and, and viewers seeing the movie, they said, okay, well, we'll get this to the most basic, close enough to being finished as we can, and then drop it out. So it looks like an unfinished work print of a film. It's, but even to that end, it's just not good. It's really, really really boring. And interestingly, both movies have a 5.2 on IMDb right now. It was kind of surprising to me, because even though I, I don't prefer one over the other, to be perfectly honest, I do seem to recall Dominion getting slightly better reviews. But then again, when you watch a horror movie and you get something boring, you tend to be a little bit more harsh on it, because it, that movie wasn't scary in the least. It wasn't interested in being scary. I think Paul Schrader wanted to make a drama. I think he actually described it as a metaphysical drama. So um, some people like to say that this is an interesting experiment, watching these two movies and watching two directors take on the same material. Well, it's really not that, because it's not the same script. It's not even similar scripts. Exorcist the Beginning is actually more of a whodunit, like a try-to-guess-who's-possessed type of thing. So it's not the same. It's not the same movie. It, it's a, you could almost say that, like I said, this is just The Exorcist Part 4 and The Exorcist Part 5. It could just be two stories about Father Marin's youth play, starring Stellan Skarsgård. So, they're both terrible. And if you want to see something where you see two directors take on the same material, watch The Omen and the remake of The Omen, because that literally had the same script. Uh, you know, they, they made very, they had a very minor rewrite on it, done by an uncredited screenwriter for The Omen remake. But The Omen is basically the same film shot exactly twice, or Gus Van Sant's Psycho and Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. You know, it's been done before, and it's been done in more interesting ways. You know... I do think watching the two Psycho movies is very interesting, and I've done that before. Now, most people are like, Gus Van Sant's Psycho was terrible. Well, it's terrible if you compare it to the Hitchcock movie, but it's honestly not awful. It's kind of interesting. It's just Gus Van Sant has no understanding of suspense or how to create suspense in a movie. because He's not a suspense director. He has no background in it. And again, Paul Schrader doing The Exorcist, one of the most legendary films of horror films of all time. No real background in it. So, of course, it was a disaster. Now, they finally stopped punishing us with bad exorcist films after this. Bad exorcist is in continuity with The Exorcist. There were actually plenty of terrible exorcism films after this. Uh, the Right with Anthony Hopkins immediately comes to mind, and I love Anthony Hopkins. That movie sucked. I hear bad things about the last exorcism movies. I never saw them. No opinion. Uh, Deliver Us from Evil was a bit of a mess, although I wouldn't call it terrible. Like I said, I've never honestly seen another good exorcism film. The Exorcist is it. I don't know why. It seems like you could do a lot with this, but just... They tend to be very boring. They tend to be very self-important. They, they, or they're just very silly. And there's there's kind of no in-between there. Now, I know there's a couple of gore movies and a couple of exploitation movies done as exorcism films. And I've seen a couple of those, and I didn't particularly care for them either. It, it just seems like no one can quite crack this formula. And it's, it's weird, because it's almost... As many times as it's been tried, you'd think someone would get it right by accident. And maybe there is a good one that I just haven't seen. 
But the exorcism of Emily Rose, which I didn't even think was that good, is probably the best of them. And again, that wasn't that good. It was it was fine. It was okay. It was it was slightly above okay because it did have good acting. And I seem to recall maybe a couple of strong visuals. I haven't seen that thing forever. That's about as good as it gets. And that's not good. So after this, they stopped doing exorcism. They went to the TV show. So the Exorcist TV show was very much a show that was post-American Horror Story. After American Horror Story broke, there were a lot of genre-oriented TV shows getting produced. They tended to be very over-the-top, very strange, very gore-heavy, but also very quirky, almost comical, but in a kind of what I, I consider to be a smug way. Like, we're being very gory, and we're being very over-the-top, almost like those, those cop show procedurals where they'll do really dark shit, but it doesn't matter because no one treats it with any gravity. Or they treat it with way, way, way too much gravity that's unearned. I've seen both of those happen. Like, it shows, like, Criminal Minds, or um, I think there's one on right now that's really like that. Um, I don't watch those shows. I'm going off of crap I've seen, like, at my parents by mistake. But anyway, it's stuff like that. So it kind of had that vibe. I mean, that show was very well acted. It was exceptionally well acted. Uh, and the first season uh, featured Gina Davis from Beetlejuice, um, Alan Ruck, who was on the Michael J. Fox show Spin City, as a, a married couple who come to think that their uh, teenage daughter is possessed. The makeup effects on that show were fantastic as well. The two lead priests, who are not actors I'm familiar with, were fantastic. I mean, the acting was across the board amazing on that show. That and the production, the production values in general were very, very good, especially for network TV. It ran for two seasons, then it was canceled. It never quite. It, it was one of those shows that always got extremely high rate, high ratings, but they were from the few people that were watching it. Uh, then, so was, mm, the second season, um, it was apparently going to be kind of like an exorcism a season because the second season is a completely different cast except for the two priests. Um, and that one focused on the guy from Harold and Kumar that was also in the recent Grudge movie. I think his name is John Cho, who ran this sort of halfway house for um, uh, teenagers with his wife, Alicia Witt, the redhead from um, Urban Legend, the, the female lead from Urban Legend. And it was all right. Yeah, I, I liked it. I, I'd say it was hot. It was like a B-plus type show. It was a B-plus type show that could have been an A-minus if they could have stopped trying to be Ryan Murphy. That was really what hurt them, was that they get, they tried to be too quirky for their own good. Now, mild spoilers for the TV show from here on out. The first season it included a kind of a cool twist where you, it um turned out that Gina Davis's character was actually Reagan McNeil from the first movie. And Gina Davis, I think, is probably about 10 years younger than Linda Blair, but I'm not sure about that. They, they might be roughly the same age. But uh, that was kind of a cool twist, that she had changed her name and because she didn't want to live with the notoriety. And it also said that her mom had kind of turned it into a bit of a media sensation. Her mom was played by um, that actress, I believe her name is Shirley Knight. She was just on the HBO Watchmen show as an uh, old version of Silk Spectre. So it, it did a, some interesting stuff. It was, it was kind of cool. Uh, the second season was good as well, and it ended on a cliffhanger. It was one of those annoying things where you, you, you knew this... Sh the people who were making this show knew it was on the bubble. They knew it wasn't getting great ratings, so why end it on a cliffhanger? So respect your audience and, and do some closure in case you don't get renewed. But, whatever. So the, Exorcist, the, cha the book on The Exorcist seems to be closed for now. I'm sure we'll get a reboot some point. I don't know if anyone would ever have the balls to remake The Exorcist, but they may. You know, who, who knows? Horror remakes don't seem to be as big now as they were 10 years ago, and no one would, could quite bring themselves to tackle it 10 years ago. So it's hard to say. But I'm sure this property isn't dead. It, it, it was too lucrative to ever really go away, especially given that the first movie is still... As much as an, a movie made in the early 70s can be a household name, it still comes on TV. You can still drop the, the name The Exorcist in a conversation with someone who's relatively movie literate, and they'll immediately know it even if they haven't ever gotten around to watching it. So that closes the book on The Exorcist, on the Exorcist when franchises shouldn't. First movie's the only good one. Uh, part 3 has some as a minor cult following. Part 2 is notoriously awful and kind of hilarious for it. Four and five are just bad. The TV show was pretty decent, but not quite... It wasn't appropriate for network TV. Honestly, if it had been a cable show, it probably would have been a minor success and could have kept running. But The Exorcist, when franchises shouldn't. Done.